Okay, Nick, it's your 150th year. That's great, isn't it? 150 years, the British Red Cross. Well, it's not my personal 150th anniversary, Ian, but it is. It's 150 years since the, the worldwide Red Cross, Red Crescent movement was formed. I mean, it's a fantastic record, a proud history, obviously very much conflict-related and, and disaster-related. And sad to say, there are no fewer of those now than there were 150 years ago. Yeah, now, you've been at this for 10 years. You were a former lawyer who got bored with lawyer, being a lawyer. Well, I just didn't feel that helping big companies get bigger was where I was meant to be in the world. I, I got the chance to go into the voluntary sector with Sue Ryder and Lena Cheshire, so I've never regretted that move, actually. And what have been the main changes during that 10 years? Well, at the Red Cross, I, as, as it happens, in 10 years ago, I joined the Red Cross at a bit of a time of crisis. There was a, a financial crisis in the organisation. Uh, and worse, there was a sort of crisis of confidence in the organisation. So I uh, came back to the Red Cross, having left it six years previously to run one of the big cancer charities. And I found an organisation that was, was in trouble, really, and morale particularly was, was at a low ebb. So uh, my big focus has been to really improve morale, improve confidence, uh, modernise and develop the fundraising activity. So the organisation is in very good heart now in our 150th yeah, and, and doing great work and important work both in this country and overseas. Now you've got 3,000 employees, you had a turnover of something like 200 million pounds. You run this as a business, with business principles I guess. You have to, I mean you have to be business like. We need uh, good quality staff to manage what is, as you rightly say, a large sum of money uh, and money that is being used to help people in really desperate need both in this country and overseas, so it has to be managed really, really well. Mm. Now, talking about money, I was looking at in your bio, and you said something quite interesting, and I'll quote it. You say, um, you're talking about money and spending money. If I'm doubtful about some proposed expenditure, I sit down and work out how many little old ladies and men with collecting tins it would take to collect that much money. And then I imagine them all in a lecture room, rather like this evening here in uh, Bristol City Hall. And I'm on stage, I have to tell them how I'm going to spend the money. It's an incredibly good test that I've often used to good effect over the years. Mm. It is. I mean, I, 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 when I first came into the sector, I joined Sue Ryder. Uh, I took a huge cut in salary. I'd been a partner in a firm of lawyers doing takeovers and mergers, so you can imagine it was a hell of a, a shock financially. I had three young kids and all the rest of it. And uh, Sue Ryder was tough. I mean, she paid very little. We got no expenses if we were, you know, having to work away from home, as I often was. We slept on people's floors or wherever we were working, or in the car if necessary. So that was a, that was a good discipline. You know, uh, we are using money given to us by very generous members of the public. They want to see it put to the best possible use. And so I, I use the test of just ordinary people particularly our volunteers, collectors out there raising that money. It's hard work raising money. It really is incredibly hard work. And we have to be sure that we're using every penny wisely and well. Mm. Now, who are your main stakeholders and how do you prioritise their needs? Well, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the voluntary sector is quite complex. We have a number of stakeholders. Obviously, our main stakeholders, our first and foremost stakeholders, are our beneficiaries, the people we're trying to help. And at the end of the day, every single decision is made with them in mind. Uh, well then, obviously secondly, our donors. I mean, we couldn't do anything without the people who, who give us money. They're absolutely key. Thirdly, I would say, our people, our volunteers and staff. We are a, a volunteer organisation. We depend on our volunteers to do most of the work that we do. And then I suppose it's the general public. I mean, out there, the people who might be disposed to support us, might be disposed to volunteer for us, might have need of our help. They're obviously key stakeholders. Now, the public, they've always had, I would have thought, significant trust in charities like yours. Is that in any way diminished by what we see going on in certain parts of the world? Someone gives money, uh, whether it be on their local high street or whatever, and perhaps they think, is it going to the right place? Is that our donation getting there? Well, I think a number of things to say there, Ian. First of all, uh, transparency and accountability are absolutely vital. We, as I said, we have to be able to explain how we spend every single penny of the money we're given. But I th and I think part of that 
it's our job to make sure that the money is spent wisely and well. In the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, we're working with sister Red Cross societies all over the world. They all subscribe to the same values, we all have the same kind of accountability systems, and obviously we can make sure through them the money does get through to people in need. But you know it's not easy. Uh, you know that there are some countries where it's harder to work than others. Syria today is an incredibly awful example where you know the volunteers of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, my sister society, 22 of them have died in the fighting. Every day, every hour, those volunteers, they had to negotiate their way through government roadblocks, opposition-held roadblocks, roadblocks run by gangsters just out to extort money. It's incredibly dangerous work and it's very difficult work and it's really hard getting the money through to the people who need it. What's incredible is that those volunteers of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent are achieving that most of the time. Talking about Syria, where do you see that situation going in terms of aid? I mean, what we see on our television screens is appalling, isn't it? Yeah. In, in Blatt's, in the recent weeks, it's, it's gone away a bit. But we were utterly shocked uh, by what we saw from the uh, alleged gas attacks. Yeah. How do you see that relating to a charity like yours? You're still going to go, you've, you've lost 22 people? Yeah. That is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's still my, Syria is my absolute top priority. I spend a lot of time on Syria. I'm very close to the, my colleagues in the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. I talk to them regularly. We've raised um, about six million pounds for Syria. We've got an appeal going on at the moment. We need more money. There are five million people, ordinary people, people just like you and me, uh, living on people's floors, living in school halls, anything to get away from the fighting. They're short of food. They're short of medicine, they're short of the absolute basic necessities of life. They've lost their jobs, they can't educate their children. Life is absolute hell in Syria. And so I, I would say a thank you to the people who have supported us so far, but we need more money. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's sort of, one last question really. Um, the UK, British Red Cross, everyone thinks they're all over the world, and suddenly, Yes, in your 150th anniversary, we see you actually helping with the setting up of food banks. So, why is that? Well, the British Red Cross is not just an international organisation, it's also a very strong UK charity. We have a lot of uh, work going on in communities all over the country. We do a lot of uh, basic care in the home. Uh, we look after refugees and asylum seekers. We're a big first aid organisation. A lot of activity uh, around the UK. And just recently, uh, we have been asked to help uh, Food Fair and the Trust of Trust to uh, help with the collection of food using our volunteers and its distribution to people in need. I mean, it is a sobering thought, isn't it, that you know there are people in our country, and indeed far more in other countries in Europe. I mean, Spain is a good example, um, who need that kind of help these days. I mean, we've all been affected by the economic crisis in one way or another, but some more than others. We're a crisis response organisation, so if another organisation comes to us to ask for help, we'll do it if we possibly can. What about support from the UK government? You know, lots of people have criticised the UK, current UK government, for giving too much aid to other regimes. How do you see that? Well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't criticise the government. I think the government's to be, to be praised, actually, for sticking to its commitment to spend 0.7% of GDP on aid overseas to people whose needs are very, very great indeed. I mean, it's, it's invidious to compare need in one country with need in another country. If you're in need, you don't care where you live, you just need help. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think the government is trying to get the balance right and, uh, well, you know, there's lots more needed, basically. Yeah. All right. That's just it. need to do a wrapping up. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Was that all right? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Oh, brilliant. Sorry, I slipped in those other things as you went along. No, it's all right. But, uh, <laughs> that's fine. Right. It's your job, isn't that's it? That's good. I think it is your job. That's good. <laughs> okay. Right. So if you want to do a Sir Nicholas, thank you very much. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll do. Uh, or yeah. a final question, or what's that? Yeah. You've done. I think you've done ten minutes so far. Oh, that's good. Okay. Can I, would you, uh, let's think, what's your 
you personally, if I say thanks very much, Nick, what's the biggest single thing if you had a gift this Christmas? Right. What's the biggest thing you would want? Something like that. What would you answer that? Well, that's a difficult question. I mean, there's so much. Yeah. Okay. I'll have a go. At that. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nick, thank you very much for talking to me this evening. Christmas is coming up. What's the biggest single gift that you could have in the 150th anniversary of the British Red Cross? Gosh, that's a good question, Ian. I mean, Christmas is a time for giving. And I think the biggest single gift that I could possibly ask for is that the incredibly generous people of Britain should go on being incredibly generous. I mean, British Red Cross, many other charities, we all do depend on ordinary people out there giving their pennies and their pounds, and it all adds up, and it all adds up to help us help more people. So I'd like to say thank you very much, but we'd like a bit more for Christmas. Thank you. Good. Great. Great.